Let's come before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Oh, dear Lord and Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, how precious it is, Lord, just to come together in fellowship each week, Lord. We do bless you for these times, Lord, and you reminded us how important they are, Lord. How good it is to come together, for brothers and sisters to come together in unity. Oh, to lift our voices in praise, Lord, to you. To be reminded in communion of that once and for all perfect sacrifice, Lord, where, whereby you came down, Lord, and took our sins, our burden of our fallen nature on yourself, Lord, to deliver us, Lord, and to give us life eternal. We thank you, Lord, for that precious, precious, incomparable gift, Lord, that you've given to us, Lord. And we thank you too, Lord, for the opportunity to search out the depth of your word, Lord. And as we come to investigate further this wonderful book of Habakkuk, Lord, I just ask you, Lord, that you would guide our thoughts, Lord, so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart, Lord, might be always acceptable in your sight. We ask this in the name of our precious Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we've been looking then at the uh, book of Habakkuk, which has got an importance out of all proportion to its small size. It's got some precious words in it that are words we need to remember. We, mean we need to be able to uh, re remind ourselves of constantly. There's that precious promise. The earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. It includes a prayer in wrath, remember mercy, O God. This is when times of judgment come and that prayer is indeed answered by God. And, and then of course there's that verse which is so important then, it's the key to all of us, to all our salvation, it's the righteous shall live by their faith. So important that it's repeated three times in the New Testament then. And when the Lord talks about the unrighteousness, he's got a lot of talk about the unrighteous, but he's got just one thing to say about the righteous. The righteous will live by their faith. And this is all epitomized then in this man Habakkuk. And his name, he means embracer. And he's actually embracing the predicament of his people. We've got this righteous man then, he's in the midst of an unrighteous nation. We can see his parallel, perhaps, with many of us in the nation that we're living in today, then. And he's got this burden, and he can't share it with anybody except his God. And, of course, he's waiting on God. He said, God, why won't you answer? Why won't you answer? And, but, of course, God does answer. He answers the prayers of the faithful, of his faithful servants. You know, I was sharing with a sister last week and she was saying, well, I've been praying, praying for months and weeks and years then for the salvation of my family. And I, I'm in the position of Habakkuk, you know, at the start of his book, saying, Lord, why don't you move them? But of course, God will move because, because James tells us, isn't he, that the prayers of a faithful man and woman achieveth much. You know, and this is told us in the book of Habakkuk. How God shows Habakkuk, yes, he is answering his prayer, but he does it in his time. So we need to be faithful in our intercession. We need to be persistent because God will move through the faithful prayers of his people if they're persistent. He's testing us, our faith, you see. He's testing our persistence. He's testing our patience then. And above all, he's testing our faith because without faith, it is not possible to please God then. So if you are in, in that position, like we all are really, the praying for, for our unsaved relatives and friends then, do persist, do persist because God always listens, always responds then to the prayers of a faithful servant. So what God is teaching then through, through the story of Habakkuk really is the importance of patience and persistence in prayer then. Um, but Habakkuk then is answered he is told, yet he is working, he's doing his work then, but of course he's not in the way that Habakkuk expects. And Habakkuk is really bowled over by what God has to tell him. And he's telling him that he has to judge his people. They've reached a point then uh, where, they, uh, where they have to be judged then. And he's doing it through the people who are e even more wicked than the people of Judah themselves then. 
But of course, we know the pattern of God. He uses the enemies of his people then to judge his people when they seep into sin and waywardness then. And then he, he sweeps away that pagan nation then after chastising his people. It's done through Assyria to Israel. It's done through Babylon then to, to uh, uh, Judah. And of course, it also works its way through in subsequent history as well then. So he uses the wicked nations to judge it. And then he sweeps away those wicked nations then. And we got to a point then in chapter 2 where we have a series of woes. There are five woes then in chapter 2. They begin then in verse, verse 6 of, of chapter 2. And we see woe unto, woe unto, woe unto. And these are the five reasons that God lays out to Habakkuk. And remember at the beginning of this chapter, he's told Habakkuk to write this down because it's not only to teach Habakkuk, it's also to teach us then. God is telling us why he has to move in judgment then. And the first of these woes then is in, is in verses 6 to 8 of chapter 2. A time will come when they will taunt you with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to them who pile up stolen goods and make themselves wealthy then by extortion. How long will this go on? Will not your debtors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their victim. You see, what God is, God is saying here is he's going to judge the Babylonians because of their avariciousness, their, their wickedness then, in coming and stealing what is not theirs then and trying to rule and govern these people. Because you have plundered many nations, the people who are left will plunder you. For you have shed man's blood, you, will, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. them. And of course the principle here is general because this could also apply in part to Judah as well because Judah has reached a point where it's got to be judged, you see. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah 22 says, But your eyes and your heart are set only on dishonest gain, on the shedding of innocent blood, and on oppression and extortion then. Well, you know, time has moved on, but because you have plundered many nations, the people who are left will plunder you. And this has always worked its way through in subsequent history. The people who do the plundering are subsequently plundered themselves then. So the first woe here then can really be summarized under theft and lust for control then, stealing, lust for control. And, um, it, of course, you, it's interesting at the present time, you probably heard a lot about this World Economic Forum and what it's trying to do through a so-called Great Economic Reset. Um, it even has a code, the politicians uttering it, it's a build back better, and then they all utter it these days. And the basic theme of this um, world economic order thing is that they're going to effectively do away with nation states like ours, um, uh, to take away people's property then, and will all be ruled by some kind of digital system then. It all sounds a bit like Revelation 13, but now of course whether it actually works out that way or, or if God allows it to work out that way, and we don't know. But, but we are told here, we are assured, that if it does, God will judge it, because this is anathema to, to him then. Control then and stealing is anathema to him and requires judgment. And then the second woe here is greed and unjust gain. It says in Habakkuk 2 then, this is 9 to 11, Woe to him who builds his realm by unjust gain, and sets up his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You've plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones on the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will, will, will echo it. So the theme of judgment here then is all this, un is, is all this gathering then of, un of unjust gains and all this unjust gathering then. And of course they, they triumph by setting themselves up <laughs> upon high. So the symbolism is like the eagle really, which is so high up then that none of its predators can actually get to it. But of course it's a worthless foundation then. And the, the, the theme here is actually played out in Babylon because uh, we, we know in Babylon 4 that Nebuchadnezzar was there and he was glorying his great achievements then. And you remember that he, he wanted a statue built to himself so big that everyone would come and worship him. 
And then we see in chapter 4 of Daniel, we see as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I've built as a royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? But the words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has taken away from you. And we know that seven years followed when he was, when he was virtually reduced as a man. He was going around eating grass then, and he, he was broken. He was a broken man for seven years then. And of course, in Daniel 5, in chapter 4, then in chapter 5, we, we read how this is uh, playing out then in the fall of Babylon as they were having a great party, thinking they're safe then. And then, of course, it, within one night, they're given over to the Medes and the Persians then. And, of course, Scripture tells us that those who've ex exploited others will eventually, those will eventually be risen up against them and will eventually be judged. So James, in chapter 5 of James, says, Oh, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, the moss have eaten your clothes, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You've hoarded wealth in the last days. So you see here we've got an allusion to what's going on in our time, the last days. Look, the wages that you failed to pay the workmen, you mowed your fields, are crying out against you. The cries of the harvester have reached the ears of the Lord God Almighty. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You flattered yourself in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered innocent men and women who were not opposing you. Well, we have to remember, of course, every man and woman is equal in God's eyes. Then the, the elite, as well as the poor, then are all equally, uh, equally valuable in God's eyes. Then, of course, the, the redeemed are redeemed, and they're separated, as we've seen, by their by their faith. But ultimately, for those who aren't, we see the judgment ultimately playing out in the book of Revelation, in chapter 6. This is chapter 6, verse 15 and 16 of Revelation. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, but every slave and every free man hid in caves and amongst the rocks of the mountains. They cry to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. How glad we are that we're spared that, aren't we? Wow. And then the third woe then, the third woe, the third reason that God tells Habakkuk that he has to judge, this concerns a violence then. And Habakkuk 2, 12 to 14 then, it says, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by crime. Has not the Lord God Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? Well, it's all grim judgment, but at this point, God inserts a verse then to assure Habakkuk that it's not going to last forever. There comes a point then where he no longer needs to judge. And this is where that precious verse is inserted then in the middle of this third woe, in the middle, in fact, of the five woes, really. But the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, oh, there, there will be this precious time then when that will happen then. When the Lord, uh, and he read the section in Isaiah at the end of last week, didn't we? Where in Isaiah 65, I won't, I won't read it again now, but in Isaiah 65, when the Lord talks about it, he said, Behold, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The formal things will pass away and will not be remembered. This is the time then when judgment is no longer necessary. And we reminded ourselves in, in the book of Isaiah that he tells us that this is God's strange work. It's the work he doesn't like to do then. Where he told us 12, uh, uh, twice in, the, in Isaiah, and he describes my strange work, my strange work then. You see, um, he would prefer us in our own minds to repent, to come to him. But of course, there does come a point when he does have to judge. And that is his strange work, the work he doesn't like to do, but because he's the perfect judge, he has to. He's perfect in love, in love but he's also perfect in judgment as well. 
And then we have the fourth woe then. This is Habakkuk 2, 15 to 17. Woe to him who gives drinks to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskins till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup of the Lord's right hand is coming round to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done in Lebanon will overwhelm you, and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. You see, so, you know, God is telling um, Habakkuk that this is what the Babylonians are going to do. You can wait on this, you'll see it happening. But they are going to be judged for this thing. So he, he assures him throughout that judgment is necessary, but they too, the, the agents of his judgment then, will themselves be judged. Well, this really concerns the corrupting of others then, the corrupting of other people then, particularly, of course, by the use of drunkenness, getting them drunken for the purpose of lust and sexual sins. And in many ways, of course, this epitomizes the, the society that we're in today, where, where acts of immorality are, are spread everywhere through the world, where, and they're sort of epitomized, really, by the clubbing craze then, which is all driven by satanic music, you know, all familiar with it, and it's, it's happening throughout the world then, but of course it's going to be judged then. Indeed, Papalon loved these parties, and it was during one of these parties, which um, we know as Belshazzar's feast, that the nation was judged. In one night, the Babylon was swept away then by the Medes and the Persians, as we read in Daniel chapter 5 then. Of course, these days, when God moves to judge in these last days, the judgment is going to be worldwide, and we can read about that in Revelation. You see, the interesting thing about Babylon is that the whole time of the Gentiles is embraced by the theme of Babylon. It starts when Babylon crushes Judah. That's the end of Jewish nationality, really, because after that they become subject people throughout history then until the days of the end when we have a spiritual then material Babylon that we learn about in Revelation 17 and 18 then where God tells us how he will judge Babylon. And that's the end, really, of the times of the Gentiles then that were talked about in the New Testament. So if, if we just see an aspect of this in Revelation 18, this is Revelation 18, chapter 2, and then with a mighty voice the angel shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. So those last verses then are, are the cry to the tribulation saints then to, to come out of this whole system there. Of course, what God has to say in the beginning there, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she's driven mad by the wine of her adulteries. That applies to the first Babylon. It applies to the present-day spiritual material Babylon then that, we, that we're living in today. And then the final woe in chapter 2 then is, is in verses 18 to, to 20. Of what value is an idol, since a man has carved it, or an image that teaches lies? For he who makes it trusts in what he has made with his hands. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life or to a lifeless stone. Wake up, can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver and there is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his, his holy temple and he says, let all the earth be silent before him. Well, Israel was addict, addicted to this kind of idolatry, Lord, in ancient Israel, of course, it was addicted to golden cars and even way back then in the in the time of Abraham Isaac, we learn about terrapims then. They still have these idols that they, that, they clung, that they clung on to. And it was really only the judging and the exile of Israel that finally cleaned this uh, 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 sort of adherence, really, to, to idolatry that cleaned Israel of that. Of course, they slipped into other problems, but they, it finally, when they came back, 
from, from Babylon then, after that 70 years of judgment, that rump of people came back. They'd effectively shed their addiction to, to idolatry. But of course, there's still a lot of people today who are addicted to uh, putting faith in statues of Buddha and these ridiculous elephant and monkey gods and, and even uh, stones and, and everything else. And of course, we, we, can, we can say how these words still apply to that. They say, woe unto him who says to wood, come to life or to a lifeless stone, wake up and give me guidance, you know? And so many people, of course, still put their faith in that. But as intelligent people, we don't believe in all that nonsense, do we? But of course, in us, the idolatry is much more insidious. It's much dangerous, really, because idolatry is anything that separates you from God. You see, so we can be involved in pleasure, in wealth, and materialism. These are all common idols, then, that separate us from God. And they, effectively, what they're doing is they're anchoring us to the earth. And we're not anchored to the earth. We have to be pilgrims. We're pilgrims, then, going to the New Jerusalem. You see, we're seeking a land not created by man, but a land created by God. And so, so our problem, the problem of the world in idolatry today, is predominantly putting things, then, before God. This is what the judgment of Habakkuk 2.18 is telling us, that God will judge it when something comes between him him then and and the person concerned then and of course he's saying that all these things are silent all these pieces of idolatry don't teach you anything they don't grant you anything and we get that last sentence there let the whole earth be silent before him he's going to speak and none of these idols of course do speak it reminds me of that uh, a verse here from psalm 46 be still and know that i am god then so, in many ways, this is one of the most important chapters, really, in the Old Testament, because God is specifying them the reason why he has to judge them. And the, and the general theme is run all the way through subsequent history, through this whole period between the ancient Babylon and the modern Babylon then. But, of course, when we see these things coming to pass, we seek our blessed hope. We don't want to be anchored to the earth, by, especially by the idolatry. In, in many ways, that fifth woe is the most serious of all, really, because it's where we're being distracted from the love of our Savior. What does Luke tell us? Luke 21, he says, When these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draweth nigh. And then that precious verse in 1 Thessalonians said, Wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus, Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. That blessed promise, you see, that we're going to be spared, that spared that wrath to come then. Well, we've got there, then that's the uh, culmination, really, of chapter 2, when the God is, tells Habakkuk to write these down then, and Habakkuk says, I'm going to wait on you now, Lord. Um, i just remind you of the first verse then, the first few verses of chapter 2, when it says, The Lord answered and said, Record the vision, inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal, and it will not fail. Although it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. And when it does come, it will not delay them. So the prayer of Habakkuk then in, in chapter 3, chapter 3 is a great chapter really of prayer and praise really. And it's, got, it's a poetic thing really. And it, it begins then in the first two verses. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. O Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. And then he requests God, he says, in wrath, remember mercy. He realizes that God has got the judge. He says, I'm going to wait. This, this is the watchman really on the wall, the principle of the watchman. I'm going to wait then until you're, you outwork your purposes. You, maybe I will live to see them, maybe I won't. But, but I will wake in anticipation then and prayer. So this chapter 3 then is a prayer of praise in the form of a poetic song. And, 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 and Habakkuk realizes now that he must stand back in awe then in reverential fear of the one who will act on behalf of his people. 
and he says renew them in our day in our time and here Habakkuk will have in mind that all God has done for his people in the past then what they've forgotten their deliverance from Egypt through the Red Sea their deliverance through the wilderness taking them up to the promised land and taking them into that promised land you see and he says we revive your work in our day renew it in our day in our time make it known then so he's uh, he, he's praying to God then that God will will renew his work and we know of course first the judgment has to come judgment in the Babylonians but God does indeed continue to move because after they serve that 70 years then in Babylon he allows a rump of them to come back then and rebuild the temple and the and the city of Jerusalem then well of course the principle of revival of reviving your work is very much a theme in preaching these days isn't it so many especially in the mega churches are predicting revivals revivals um, often not predicting that of course God is also a God of righteous judgment as well as a God of love so the revivals may come but when we look around the world and see where the Lord is working powerfully it's amongst people who are suffering it's amongst people who are being persecuted and they're being martyred that's where the Lord is working in a big way you know these days and we've got to challenge ourselves you know are we prepared to go through that suffering maybe even martyrdom to see the Lord work in the way he's working in the third world now in this land so that's the implications of revival you see and the implications are challenge that is not often considered you know when we're when we're asking God to to, to revive them and it's just like really in the times of Israel's uh, youth in the time of the judges you know they kept slipping back into sin God sent a judge then when they cried out in repentance and it was only when they cried out in repentance that God would send the judge to deliver them and it happened through seven major and and six minor judges then throughout that 300 odd years of the span of the book of judges then but as Habakkuk continues in this chapter 3 we get several remarkable indications really that now Habakkuk is being taken not only from the immediate situation then of the impending judgment of Babylon but he's taken through right into what's going to happen in the last days in the culmination of the age and then if we read then verses 3 to 5 it says God came from Taman the Holy One from Mount Paran Salah his glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth his splendor was like the sunrise rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden plagues went before him pestilence followed his steps wow what some statements here there are in those three verses aren't there and in the middle of them you see God inserts in the text Salah now this word then Salah is found in 71 times in the in the in the Psalms of course we have to reflect on, on what God is saying at intervals throughout the Psalms then and it's mentioned three times in this book of Habakkuk then and it derives from a Hebrew verb which which means to exalt to lift up and it can mean a pause to elevate to a higher key or an increase in volume when you're praising God it, it can reflect on what's been sung and exhort God further in praise then and it's to lift up instruments for something like a trumpet fanfare so you see we can imagine in this verse here we're told sound the trumpet there's something very important to be said here you see God is going to move and we read there his glory covered the heavens his praise filled the earth his splendor like the sunrise well here you see we've got a specific places mentioned we've got Taman and we've got Mount Paran mentioned and these are in Edom then areas uh, just to the east then of, of Israel and they're at the point where Moses was giving the people of Israel shortly before his death he was giving them 10 sermons then teaching them before he knew they were going to be led by Joshua into the promised land and in Deuteronomy 33 as part of one of these lessons and Moses has a very interesting thing to say he says no this is the blessing with which Moses the, the man of God blessed the sons of Israel before his death he said the Lord came from Sinai he shined on them from Seir 
he shone forth from the Mount Paran, and he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning. Now, what on earth is that verse inserted there for? Well, it's a predictive verse. It's a poetic verse then that refers to the, to the, to the end of days. And, of course, we think of our Lord coming back through the Mount of Olives, don't we? Because this is in Acts, Acts 14 then, where the Lord will come back at the same point at the Mount of Olives, where, where, where he, he rose up then at the end of his ministry then. There was, but of course, before he comes back to the Mount of Olives, we, I mean, it's clear from Scripture, the first must come through the area to the east, Bosra, because this is where he sent the remnant of the Jewish people then to keep them safe during the tribulation period. Well, we know, of course, that the Lord is going to come back only when his people say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And although Zechariah tells us that two-thirds of Israel are going to be wiped out in the tribulation, a third will repent. And this is the third then that Paul talks about, all Israel will be saved. And there are several key prophecies in the Old Testament that tell us what's going to happen here. This is Isaiah 63, verse 1. And who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Bosworth? the one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Now, of course, we did learn last week that, that Habakkuk mentioned it, and the same verse was used in Hebrews, the writer in Hebrews, of course, Habakkuk was looking from the Old Testament perspective when only a few people were graciously given the, the Holy Spirit to see things then, and that could be taken away if they wandered then. Habakkuk obviously had the Holy Spirit then, and he talks about oh, waiting for it to come. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews used the same verse, but it uses he instead, and we see that it becomes a he, and the he, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what Isaiah is referring to here. The one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in greatness in his strength from Bosra. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And then the theme of this protected body, rump of Israel then, in the Revelation, those who will be saved, is also referred to in the book of Micah. Micah chapter 2, verse 12, it says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of you. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put you together as the sheep in Bosra, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They will make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. And then in Daniel 11, it says, He, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, shall enter also into the glorious land, Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even in Edom and Moab, and the chief children of Ammon. So there Daniel then is referring to this area then, to the east of Israel then, the, the areas of Abon, of Edom and Moab then, where these people will be protected. And it's really an outcome of the uh, warning that our Lord Jesus gives in Matthew 24, when he talks to the Jewish people now of what's going to happen to them at the end of the age. And in 24, Matthew 24, 16, he says, let them that be in Judah flee into the mountains. That's what they're doing, you see, that they're fleeing then into the mountains then. So we see then that Israel has to flee to the mountain as a hiding place, the closest place being really the uh, suitable place being then um, th this area of what is now Jordan then, Edom, Petra or Bosra then. And Jesus will return them to save them first before moving his way to Jerusalem then into the Mount of Olives when he comes in glory, when they finally shout it out, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord then. And from here then he shall come in great glory. The, the Apostle John, he can only relate the glory to the power of the sun shining in his face, you see. And, he said he was and then, of course, he's given a, a, just a little spectacle of that, really, on that Mount of Transfiguration. We there get the image of the glorified Lord Jesus Christ when it says, this is in Matthew 17, it says, He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garment became as white as light then. 
And all of this is really tied together in that small book of Jude, the book then just before the book of Revelation. And we see there that evidently Jude had access to the book of Enoch then, the book which is not ordained scripture actually, but it was apparently written down by Enoch, although it's been corrupted, I'm afraid, in the versions we've got, but it was written down by Enoch before the time of Noah. So right at the beginning of man's history, Enoch is referring to what's happening right at the end of man's history. And Jude records this. He says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these days, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You see there, uh, Jude is telling us, you see, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his saints, the redeemed people then, the, the, effectively his bride. He's coming back, you see, with his bride to execute judgment then and to convince all the ungodly amongst them then of their ungodly deeds. And we see that working out in Revelation chapter 19 where it says, I saw heaven opened and beheld a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but him himself. He was clothed with a vesture dripping in blood. No, his blood has already been shed. It's been, bled on the, it's been shed on the cross. So this is not his blood, it's the blood of his enemies, you see. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that's the Word of God then, that with it he will smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So what we see here is, is Habakkuk in, the, in these first few verses then of his chapter 3, he's introducing us, he's taking us up forward in time then to what's happening, happening at, the, <laughs> at the end of the age then. And he continues then, in verses 6 to 11, he says, He shook the earth, he looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumble and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwelling of Midian in anxious. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots then? You uncovered your bow and you kill, called for many arrows. Selah, here it is again. Blow the trumpet, you see. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and they writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deeps roared and lifted up the waves on high. The sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of the flashing spear. Wow, here you see Habakkuk is moving into something that's beyond our comprehension. It's the shaking of everything, the shaking of everything. The only thing that's not shaken, of course, are the people of God, that they've been spared of Praise the Lord. They're, well, th th there's a lot more really in, in this poetic last chapter of, of Habakkuk. I think that's probably an important point to start, really, because I'd like to explore through the wider gamut of Old and New Testament scriptures, really, really what is the significance of the watchman? You know, what is the prophet? What properties did Habakkuk have that we should seek, really? We're living in a strange time, really, you see, especially in North America. I mean, as Cyril was mentioning, these mega, mega churches, and there's really turmoil currently in the churches in North America because they believe they've got lots of prophets. And, but nobody prophesied COVID. But lots of them prophesied that President Trump would win. And of course, neither of these, things, neither of these prophets were sort of honest prophets, the prophets of God, you see. So what's gone wrong here? We need to ask ourselves, you know, are there really people with the properties of Habakkuk? People who have the property of Paul then? And you see, prophecy is not 
just protecting the future. Prophecy is declaring the word of God. And a true prophet seeks the heart of God. And I'd like to look into the scriptures, you know, both Old and New Testament, that seek out what a true prophet is. And we can ask ourselves, are we, are we seeing true prophets in these days? Um, so that's chapter 2 then, and the introduction to chapter 3. Let's come before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Oh, dear Lord and Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, we, we thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the absolute reliability and consistency of that word, Lord, how we can link the Old Testament and the New, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this precious witness to your prophet Habakkuk, Lord, and all he's teaching us, Lord, a great lesson, Lord, that he had to write it down, Lord, so that we could learn from it, Lord. And it's teaching us patience. It's teaching us persistence in prayer. And above all, it's teaching us, Lord, that what you require in your people is faith, Lord. So give us faith, Lord, persistence in prayer and consistency in our lives, Lord, as we seek, Lord, that precious day, Lord, when you will indeed come again. Maybe you come to rapture us, Lord. Maybe you don't, Lord. But whatever happens, Lord, we put our complete trust in you, Lord, your absolute reliability, Lord. We thank you, Lord, most unreservedly, Lord. Unreservedly, Lord, may we commit ourselves to you, Lord, wholeheartedly, Lord. And may bear in mind, Lord, that what you require of us, Lord, is faith, persistence, and patience, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to keep these precious gifts in mind, Lord, as we go out our, our different ways, Lord. We ask this in the name of our precious Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.